glad to be with you this morning. Welcome, whether you are here on campus or you're online. It is good to be with you. Lent in peace to you. Um, you know, if you're joining us as well for the first time, I say to you, you are welcome, you are loved, you are safe, and God is well pleased with you. May you hear those words today from our benevolent Trinitarian God. Let me begin with a story today about my mother. So my mother was here recently. Some of you got to meet her, and uh, she's gone back home, so I guess I can talk about her now. <laughs> uh, just kidding. I love my mom. Yes, yes, yes. My mom is, uh, if you met her, she's a very affectionate person. Uh, still to this day, I find myself having these moments where she grabs my face like this, and then says that she loves me, she's missing me so much. And you have to understand though, like in the sixth grade, in high school, that sequence was not something I wanted in my life. And I often ran away, I would hide from my mom if I saw my mom. I know it sounds kind of neat, but it was just like, I, I can't have that right now. Not in front of my friends and all of this, right? Um, but then I realized something about my mother. In the sixth grade, I was, uh, Part of this, uh, I was in typing class. Now, some of you who are younger, uh, yes, we had a class where it taught you how to type on a typewriter. Um, and I was in this class, and my friend was next to me. Uh, we were very good friends. Uh, we would talk about all kinds of things, the Lakers in particular. And I remember he uh, started uh, tapping or you know pressing on one of the keys of my typewriter. And the first time he did it, I laughed. And we didn't have the delete button, so we had like this eraser key. But you know that even after using that eraser key, the paper didn't look the same anymore. And so he did it a second time, and now I was not laughing. And I told him, don't do that. By the third time, he did it again, but this time I caught him, and I was trying to brush him off my, my, my you know, we're sitting on these roller chairs, and I tried to brush him off, and I brush him off, and he falls down. It makes this big noise. And my teacher comes over and sends us directly to the principal's office. And there in the principal's office, uh, he, you know, he called my mother. My mother came. My mother heard the story. Uh, I, I, I got in the car with my mom, and I tried to explain myself as well. Now, you have to understand something. I've seen my mom and I don't want to see my mom angry. I mean, she's a, a strong Latina woman, and she's going to tell me everything I need to know. But in this moment, when my mom and I were in the car, and I explained what happened, I remember her saying to me, don't ever do that again. And I love you very much. It's the moment that I realized that I could perhaps do anything in the world, and my mom would still say to me, I love you very much. That her love was present no matter what I did. And still to this day, I hear those words of unconditional love always present for me. I share this story with you today because the wisdom from Luke's gospel I think presents to us one of the most interesting images of God in all of Scripture. I titled today's sermon, All Jesus Wants to Do is Mother. You see, this passage is one of those passages in the Gospels which allows us uh, and shows us just how little we know about Jesus' life. I mean, this much we do know about the passage. The Pharisees were not friendly people, although we see it here. Somehow Luke's gospel is presenting, portrays the Pharisees as such kind-hearted, neighborly people. Portrays them as though they were seriously uh, uh, caring for the, 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 the well-being of Jesus. They seem to somehow be such nice guys, but... The genuine motivation for such a warning about Herod's intentions to kill Jesus could be considered another temptation for Jesus. Let me explain. 
the Pharisees wanted to stop Jesus. They wanted to stop Jesus from what he was doing, from healing and teaching. They wanted him to leave. So what we're, he- we're seeing here, in my opinion, is yet another attempt to stop the mission and the ministry of Jesus. Now, I truly enjoyed reading this passage because I love Jesus' boldness and fortitude. He resisted the temptation. He resisted the temptation to give into fear of death threats. And in that very moment, he was able to overcome and not be deterred and be able to complete his work. Now, you heard the response to Herod's intentions, right? Jesus said, go tell that fox that I'm throwing out demons and healing people today. Tomorrow and on the third day, I will complete my work. You see, Jesus offers at least two hints here for us. Firstly, he gives us a prelude, perhaps, to the Passion account, which is referring to uh, when he says today, tomorrow, and the third day, perhaps he is referring to the three days in the tomb. So Jesus is alluding to his death in Jerusalem. He knows that Jerusalem is the city where prophets go to die. But also, did you catch the metaphorical language? Jesus calls Herod a fox. What do we know? What do we know about a fox? Well, we know that a fox is a clever predator, that it stalks its prey, that it lives and dwells off the death of unsuspecting meek prey. We also know that a fox adapts well to its environment. But what is this all about? Why would Jesus call Herod a fox? It can be rather cryptic, right? But I think Jesus offers more to the narrative because then he presents the image of himself, listen to this, as a mother hen protecting her baby chicks under her wings. See, apparently this is how Jesus sees Jerusalem. But why? Why such love? Why such love and protection for Jerusalem? You see, we don't read about other visits to Jerusalem for Jesus in the other Gospels. We don't see a prior love for Jerusalem in other readings. Still, it is evident that Jesus loves Jerusalem. He wants to protect them like a mother hen protects her baby chicks under her wings. They are safe. But here is where I believe wisdom enters the room. Here is where I want to invite you to open your heart, your mind, your soul to be fully present in this moment. Because this is where we invite the Holy Trinity to speak into us, to, it, it, to really invite us into this moment of growth and understanding to perhaps guide us in this Lenten season. You see, Jesus tries to protect the children of Israel from the feet of the children of Jerusalem, from the lurking dangers, the foxes, shall we say, that they are not willing. Did you hear? They are not willing. He laments their the, the disobedience, uh, their unwillingness to be mothered. I wonder how many of us are willing to be mothered. You see, Jesus laments the resistance of those who don't want to be mothered. You know, Jerusalem wanted to kill him, and all he wanted to do was love them. There is something which hurts so much as to go to someone and offer love, and to have that love rejected. It is bitter. It is tragic to give one's heart to someone only to have it broken. That's what happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. This is what Jesus' love looks like, unconditional, always present, regardless of how difficult one is, regardless of how challenging one is, Jesus' love remains for us. Let me ask you, Are you willing to be mother? 
Let's be honest, because intentionally or unintentionally, we push God away. We do give in to the temptation of self-reliance and self-rule. Knowingly and unknowingly, we do separate ourselves from the divine. We do not like to submit. We do not like to obey. We do not want to be mother. And Jesus laments this. He laments the disobedience of his church and its members. We too are Jerusalem. We too break the heart of God when we reject his mothering. And this is evident not only in today, but it is evident in our history for a nation to consider itself exceptional and triumphal on its own merits, on its own merits is false, to build a, a, a nation on the backs and of enslaved black and brown bodies, to build a nation on the already inhabited lands of indigenous peoples. It's not so exceptional. It's quite ordinary. Any nation that would be exceptional would, would be exceptional if it was given free labor and free land. You see, we too break the heart of God. Still today, the current demonic manifestations of empire persist. There is white supremacy, corrupt wealth, greed, privilege, war, death. There is invasion of a nation. There is the demonization of Muslim people, of Mexican people, of Asian people, as though somehow they are responsible for an entire global pandemic. The lack of mattering of black and brown bodies, the discrimination of the LGBTQIA plus community. We too reject the mothering of God. And Jesus, stood up to the power of empire in his day to make a point. He did stand with the poor. He did stand with the marginalized. He did stand with the oppressed. He rejected Jerusalem's organized monarchy and priesthood. He rejected Jerusalem's institutionalized religion. He rejected those who benefited from such systems. And all he wanted to do, all that Jesus wanted to do, was to mother the children of Israel. In a Similarly, all that Jesus wishes to do with us is mother us. Protect us against the foxes of the world, the political foxes, the, the spiritual foxes, the emotional and mental foxes, the, even the financial foxes of this world. All that Jesus wants to do is mother us. Gather us. Like a mother, hen gathers her chicks. Protect us under his wings, under his love. And right here, I want to submit to you this morning, is precisely the invitation for this Lenten season. Will you let yourself be mother? Will you let yourself be protected? Will you let yourself be loved? So part of the Lenten pilgrimage is to authentically discover who you truly are, who God says you truly are. And it is comforting this morning to know that Jesus is not an authoritarian father, but a loving mother who died on the cross to demonstrate that kind of motherly love took away our shame, our transgressions, our failures, our mistakes, our constant defiance of being mothered, and gives us his forgiveness, his successes, his righteousness, his love, and his protection. And on the third day, he rose again to give us liberation. Because it is assuring to know that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. It is liberating to recognize that our Trinitarian God, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, keeps gathering us, keeps protecting us, keeps sustaining us. To know that we will receive grace upon grace, even if we do not deserve it. I mean, how should one respond to such grace, such love, and such inclusion? You see, I believe it should inspire us 
It should inspire us to give away that same kind of love, that same kind of grace to all creation. I mean, after all, we don't exist for ourselves, right? We, rather, we exist to be in partnership with the triune God, with the three in one. We are invited into this flow, shall we say, a Trinitarian round dance where the members and persons of the divine encircle one another in generosity, love, and service. And we are invited into that flow. Did you think? We are invited into that flow into that circle, into God's mission of love, of reconciliation, of healing, of the time. You see, stepping into that flow is what full to the brim living looks like. Stepping into that flow, we get to experience the divine in a whole new set of ways overflowing with God's love for us, fuller than we could ever imagine, spilling over with God's love for us, present no matter what we do, and Jesus' arms are wide open, covering us with wings of your mother. Are you willing to be mother? Willing have your faith. Have someone's hands, maybe your mother, maybe some others, please let her tell you that, that she loves you. And all she wants to do is protect you. That is full to the very That is the Lenten invitation for the sister. Step into it. Word of God and word of life. And we all say, thanks be.